Thank you all very much. And um, Natalie's going to help me here, so uh, we'll try to get this right. Let, we have two rules before I start, all right? Two. Can everybody up in the back here yeah. see my fingers? Yeah. Two rules. Rule number one, you can ask questions anytime you want. You know, there is a formal question and answer period when I finish, but I sometimes don't finish. So if you have a question that's burning, ask it. Uh, as it comes to mind. For those of you who are in the remote sites, and I can see some of you, uh, what we're going to try to do, if you have a burning question, zap it in. Uh, someone will get it over the email and will interrupt and say, hey, there's a question from here or there or Perth or somewhere. So ask the questions when you have, when they come to mind. Second rule, and this is probably the most important rule, there are no dumb questions, okay? Don't, don't sit there on your hands wanting to ask a question, but don't because you think it's a dumb question. If it comes to mind, it's a good question. So uh, there are no dumb questions, only two rules. Natalie, why don't we get, let's put up the first slide and we'll see. Um, I just wanted to tell you a little bit about NASA before we get started. How, how many of you have ever looked up NASA's website? Anybody? Okay, and you probably know we have, nowadays, we have three big, what we call mission directorates. We have science, uh, human Exploration and Operations, and that, that's a combination of two former directorates. One was Space Operations, which was the Space Shuttle and the International Space Station, our Spacecraft Communications and Navigation, and then the Exploration Mission Systems Directorate. And back uh, it, a few years ago, that was where we were looking at exploration. The old Constellation program was a part of that. And once we got, once I became the NASA Administrator, and we finished the uh, Space Shuttle program, we decided that everything that, that dealt with human exploration should probably be combined into one mission directorate. So that's how we have the Human Exploration Operations Mission Directorate. This, the third one is actually called the Aeronautics Mission Directorate. It is the big A in NASA, I say. Most people say it's the little A in NASA. Uh, it's the smallest directorate we have, but they probably do as much to affect your and my life every day as any of the other directorates, because as the name implies, it's the Aeronautics Research Mission Directorate. We look at everything from airplanes, drones, uh, airspace, air traffic management, and one of the big things that we're doing in the United States right now is trying to help the, the FAA, our Federal Aeronautics Administration, the Department of Defense, the Department of Homeland Security, in developing a modern uh, 21st century, if you will, 22nd century, uh, air transportation system that will enable us to get from point A to point B a lot more smoothly and efficiently than we do today, trying to get cleaner airplanes, quieter airplanes, faster airplanes. So that's ARMD. We also have a program office that's called the Technology Development Program Office. And you won't see, I don't think I have a slide about it, but, but I'll tell you about it because the program, uh, the Technology Development Program Office kind of umbrellas everything that we do in NASA. In order to get anywhere from here on out, there are incredible number of new technologies that we need, new capabilities we have. Uh, if we're going to go to Mars, and you will hear me say all the time, uh, President Obama has told me that he wants to have American astronauts and our partners in the Martian environment by the mid-2030s. That we can do, but we don't know how to do it yet. Uh, we don't have all the capabilities, the technological capabilities. We know what we need to have, but we don't have it. And so the technology development uh, program is actually where we're going to do that kind of stuff. So uh, this is science, earth science up on the left. Uh, actually, we call it astrophysics. And um, up in the right, that's where we study the origins of the universe. You're an astrophysicist, huh? What's your name? Jason. Jason. Jason went, yeah. Uh, so he's a Hubble Space Telescope guy, or James Webb Space Telescope. All the discoveries of our universe, from uh, exoplanets, you know what those are? They're, they're planets in, around other suns. Uh, you know, when I came into NASA in 1980, I'd never heard the term exoplanet. I'm not sure we, there probably were some really smart people who knew that there were such things out there, but we never really talked in any detail about planets orbiting other suns, other stars. There are millions, if not billions, of other stars in the universe as we know it. And many of those stars, if not all of them, we think have planets that orbit them just like our sun has its planets orbiting. And many of them, we think, may be Earth-like planets. And that's what we're really interested in because if there are, then that means that there are people like, and, and understand what I say when I say like you and me. They may not look like you and me, 
but, but if, you believe that, if you believe in exoplanets and Earth-like planets, there may be other life forms in other solar systems. And that's, what, that's one of the big questions that NASA asks all the time. Are we alone? Uh, you know, is there other life in our universe? Down here, heliophysics, who knows what that is? Help me, somebody. Yes? Sun, sun. study of the sun. What's your name? Martin. Martin. Martin, all right. What else do you know about heliophysics? What else do we learn from heliophysics? What does the sun give us? Heat, Heat. light, energy. energy. What about bad stuff? Radiation, Radiation. space weather. Space weather has become a new hot topic around Washington, D.C. because people, I don't have mine with me, but people with cell phones and all that kind of stuff, they're worried about picking up the cell phone and having it go <laughs> There's no transmission. Or your television goes <laughs> uh, The sun's been really, really active of late. Ah, that's it. <laughs> We're being hit by a burst of solar radiation. But the sun's energy as it travels across the universe to us is we consider space weather. Uh, you all are in a very fortunate location down here. And I don't, you see Aurora, the Aurora Borealis down here? No, you can't? Uh, I'm surprised. But the two ends of the spectrum are the North Magnetic Pole and the South Magnetic Pole. What's different about them from the rest of, of Earth's shell? Help me. What is it? Go ahead. Somebody said it. Uh, they get really cold. That's true. <laughs> That's very true. But what else? What's, uh, what is the magnetosphere? Well, not the, no, that's, that's Aurora Borealis, and, it, and it is, it is a, it's a result of the way our magnetosphere is shaped. But what is the magnetosphere? Just describe it to me in common terms. How about nuts? It's a shell, like a walnut shell. And Earth is a, you know, round sphere. We have this magnetic field that protects Earth. And it emanates from the, from the two poles, from the North Pole and the South Pole. You all are, most of you are high schoolers, so where are the teachers? Okay, teachers, I'm putting you on, on spot here. <laughs> Come on, don't be embarrassed. Raise your hands. Teachers, teachers, where are you? Okay, have we ever, and this is, I hate it, but this is the way that elementary school teachers talk. Now we must do this. Okay, teachers, have we done the demonstration with our students where we take a piece of paper or a piece of glass and put metal filings on it and put a bar magnet underneath it so they can see what Earth's magnetosphere looks like? I see some of the students going, yes. So teachers, if you forgot, yeah, you did it, OK? <laughs> but what does it look like? When you put the bar magnet under the glass or under the piece of paper, what do the filings do? What do they make? Give me letters. Looks like a forward and a backward C, right? That come together at the poles. That's the magnetosphere. That's the shell that protects Earth. Well, down here and up there, where those magnetic lines of force come into Earth's magnetic poles, it's weak. And so as the space weather goes traveling across our solar system, whether it's energy from Jupiter or Saturn or the sun or anything, it usually goes around Earth. It's, it's, it's deflected by the magnetosphere. But at the poles, some of it comes in, and those particles, those Particles of energy just energize our atmosphere, and you have the northern and southern lights, aurora borealis and aurora australis. And so that's why I say, you know, if you get a chance sometime, they're incredible. They're breathtaking. Or go again to the NASA website and look up, oh, we, this year has been absolutely incredible from the International Space Stations. All the aurora just kind of wisping around. So that's heliophysics. Last one is planetary science, self-explanatory. Next slide. Uh, <laughs> Come on, what have we been doing? What do we do? Anything that's of interest to you? What are you, what are you interested in? What do you want to hear me talk about? Anything? Or you just, you just, you're just looking for a break from school? Budget. The, seriously? Come on. That's why I'm here. That's why I left DC. I figured, you want to talk about the budget? We have a big, we, we do. Okay, let me talk about the budget. We have a big budget. The proposal, okay? The president's proposal, because you may really be interested. I'm taking you at your word. The president's proposal, that's okay. I said there are no dumb questions. That is not a dumb question, trust me. The president's proposal for NASA for fiscal year 13, which is next year. We're in, in fiscal year 12 right now, and we have about an $18 billion budget. Next year, it's $17.7 billion, and that, that's a lot of money. 
It's not anywhere near what we need to do all the things that you all expect, that everybody expects of NASA, but it's relatively healthy. The bulk of it goes into human spaceflight, human exploration. Uh, the largest portion of it goes into science, however. And then there's that tiny part that I talked about in aeronautics. Yes? What if you had the budget for the U.S. military? What if I had the budget for the U.S. military? You and me, man. <laughs> you and me. We could do big things. If we, and I mean, this is, a, this is a what if, okay? And I usually don't do, where's Mike Cabbage? Is Mike not here? Mike Cabbage is my, my communications guy, so he's not here. I can blame him. Uh, Everybody always wants to deal in suppositions. People always want to say, what happens if you don't get this? You asked, a, I love that question, because nobody, very seldom does somebody say, what happens if you had a budget this size? If we had a budget that was twice what we have right now, um, I would not be worried about bringing about the success of commercial space, as a matter of fact. Companies like Boeing, SpaceX, uh, Sierra Nevada, many other companies that are getting ready to compete right now to build a system to take humans to the International Space Station, uh, we could adequately fund them and, and, I mean, we'd be able to put humans in space from America within a couple of years. You know, that's, that's, what, that's what the difference in, in the budgets that we have, which is understandable. So I'm not saying, you know, these are very difficult fiscal times, but, but you ask the questions. In, the, in terms of planetary science, We'd be putting together a mission right now with our international partners to get as much science from Mars as we possibly could. We might be mounting a, a mission to Europa. Uh, you know, one of the, the, you're really going berserk here. Man, I thought you were, you were an astrophysicist. But planets, astrophysicists, uh, that's all the same. So you know about Europa. You know, Europa is this huge moon that has water, we think. I mean, it's covered in ice but we think it's got the largest ocean in the world that we know about, and it may have, like, real water. And if it does, it could have life. It could have life in, you know, the form of sea creatures or stuff like, or sea things, not creatures. You think about creatures, that's not good. Sea things, but we don't know. So if you ask, and I would put huge amounts of money into aeronautics so that instead of, you know, wondering if we can ever have a supersonic transport, we'd build a supersonic transport. Uh, we would have... Uh, I, just on and on and on. So great thing. Good question. Thank you. This is Juno on its way to Jupiter. It is actually an active mission right now. We launched it last year. What looks odd about this satellite? And that's a picture, by the way. That's not really Ju Juno. What looks odd about it? It's do it, three things. What are those three things? Now, remember, we're talking about going to Jupiter. Okay? Who knows? What do we use? Jupiter's a long way away. And Juno is taking months, years, actually, to get to Jupiter. Uh, how do we usually power it normally? He got it right down here. I know you, you knew the answer. Nuclear. We usually have a little nuclear power source. First time ever we're sending something to a distant planet, Jupiter, and it has solar cells. These are three big solar panels. New technology that enables us to believe that we can send the satellite all the way to Jupiter and it will be powered by solar cells by energy from the sun all the way to Jupiter. If this works, when it works, uh, this will be the first time we will have done this. So that's, this is a big deal, really big deal. Next one. Uh, this is, the, I love these, ebb and flow. Uh, it's called GRAIL, is the experiment. It's twin satellites orbiting the moon now. We launched uh, ebb and flow last year. Normally it's a two or three day mission to the moon. We took eh, months. So, Ebb and flow, the two, we, we had a contest in the United, I think it was a contest all over the world. And uh, some students from Montana, elementary school students from Montana named them Ebb and Flow. And I am told that they came up with a name because they follow each other around the moon. And as they do, they're, they're subject to the moon's gravitational field. And so what we're trying to do is map the gravitational field of the moon, but also there are instruments on these two satellites that enable us to look all the way into the core of the moon. So we're going to learn more about the moon than we've ever known before. But as they go down, things speed up as they go, as they go lower. They slow down as they go higher. So as, as the gravitational field causes these things to go down, go faster, go slower, they ebb and flow. Ah! So that elementary school students came up with that. So that's ebb and flow. Go to the next one, please. This is the master. Mars Science Laboratory Curiosity. We launched it Thanksgiving weekend this past year. It's, uh, it's on an eight-month mission to Mars. August 5th, 
somewhere in the world, August 6th, some other places in the world, this thing's going to land on Mars. What's the big deal? Well, it's the largest rover we have ever sent anywhere else. It's the size of a Volkswagen. Uh, very difficult mission because we're not exactly sure, you know, what the Martian atmosphere is like, so it's got to do this aerodynamic entry uh, to the surface. When it gets there, we have some retro rockets that are going to fire on the lander and psh, cause it to hover for a little while, and we're going to do something very simple in looks simple anyway. We have a, a sky crane, so it's going to be lowered to the surface of Mars on some cables. When it senses that it's on the surface, the cables will break at the, will be released at the rover itself. The lander will fly away somewhere and then park itself on the Martian planet. And then Curiosity is its name. It's going to roam, range the planet. It could be there for 55 years. It's got, it does have a nuclear power source, so it could operate for 55 years. Its mission is two years of roaming the planet. It moves in, uh, you know, kilometers a day. Well, that's probably a little bit much. That sounds like a lot. Meters a day, let me put it that way, okay? Uh, compared to, say, centimeters. So we can really range all over. It's landing in a place called Gale Crater. We can do that because of the precision landing system we're using. If it, if it landed the way we did Opportunity and Spirit, the previous rovers that landed in sort of a balloon, you know, and bounced around and did stuff, you just have to, you need a big area. Question. Uh, I think we've got a question from Christchurch Grammar School about uh, Mars. Uh, see, James, did you have a question about that? Um, how far away from getting humans safely to Mars and back, and what are some of the new developments and requirements to do this? Okay, how far to get humans there and back? Yes. In time. It's an eight-month mission right now. So among the things, remember I talked about needing technology development? What, the two threats in sending, two big, well, the two big challenges in sending humans to Mars. Number one, radiation. We're not, fully, uh, we're not fully knowledgeable on the long-term impacts of radiation, mainly on the central nervous system. I don't think there, I don't know very many medical people who are afraid that a, a human will arrive at Mars dead. Uh, you know, we're not, that's not what we're worried about. But the central nervous system in the human body is a big computer. And what we're worried about is central nervous system interrupts. You know how you get, I was talking about space weather messing up your cell phone. Uh, the radiation environment between here and Mars could mess up our cell phone. I mean, it could mess up your brain and you get there and you may not even be able to turn a switch or something because of disruptions in the central nervous system. We just don't understand it well enough yet. So that's our number one challenge. The next thing is the time. Eight months is way too long to, to take to get humans there. We would love to cut that down by half. You know, a four-month mission, that's half the exposure to radiation. We think we understand that a little bit better. So those are the two things. And I think your, your other question was, how are we going to do it? Well, we're mounting an, an effort right now to pull our collab collaboration among our international partners, uh, industry in America and elsewhere, and academia. And academia, schools, colleges, they tend to be among the largest sources for help in knowing how to do this kind of stuff. Right now, as I mentioned, President Obama wants us to be able to have humans in the Martian environment, whether that's on a uh, moon of Mars, uh, orbiting Mars, preferably on the surface by the mid-2030s. So that's, that's our challenge right now. Ho hopefully that answered it. Um, the next one up there. Was that Jane, by the way? James. James, thank you. Uh, three lessons, okay? I, I'm not going to bother you. I know you all, you say, please, don't, don't talk to me and tell me things to do. I, I only have three pieces of advice, and then I'll leave. Uh, leave the, the advice. And I'm not going to tell you anything you have not heard before, but I think it's really important and I just want to emphasize it because I know your teachers tell you this, your parents tell you this, and hopefully you tell each other this. You've got to study really hard. No matter what you want to do, you really have to focus in the classroom and, and you need to just, just pay attention when you're in the classroom. When you go out, you know, whether you do recess or sports or music or whatever it is, have fun when you do that and focus on that. But when you're in the classroom, stay focused on the academics. I just use this airplane. It's an old NASA airplane. You're going to have uh, the ambassador and I were talking because we've got Marines who are getting ready to come back to Australia uh, after many years of being away. And they're going to be around Darwin and Perth and stuff. And one of the airplanes that they're going to operate is uh, called an Osprey. Uh, MV-22. It's a tilt rotor airplane. It uh, can go 300 miles an hour when you're just going from point A to point B, but it takeoffs and lands like a helicopter. This is the XV-15. It was built by a co collaboration between NASA, Bell, Bell Boeing, Vertol, 
and the Ames Research Center way back in the 70s. And, uh, and the, the Marine Corps happened to see it, like it, and it took a long time, 30, 40 years in development to get it to the MV-22 or the X to, to, from the XV-15. So you gotta study really hard. Next one, you have to work hard. By work hard, I, that is what I mean. I mean focus. When you're in the classroom, forget about sports, forget about your extracurricular activities, just focus on the work of the classroom. Um, you know, how many of you play sports? Anything, rugby, football, all that stuff? Anybody have a coach who doesn't tell you if you wanna win, you gotta work hard? Any coach not tell you that? That's all they mean, focus on my sport right now. Uh, if you're a musician, your music teacher tells you the same thing. You know, they'll pound you on your knuckles if you're taking piano. They don't do that anymore? <laughs> That's why I quit taking piano, my knuckles got sore. But, Anyone who wants you to be good will tell you, you've really got to work hard. So that's, that's what I mean here. I show this airplane because, again, it's a NASA experiment. It's an X-plane. Uh, it was the X-29. We don't fly it anymore. What's, what's wrong with it? Wings are swept forward. What would you think if this is a highly, very highly computer augmented airplane, which means it can't fly without a computer being on? What do you think would happen to this thing if the computer failed? It would actually just... It's inherently unstable, so it would just, you know, just the aerodynamic forces would, would take it, lift up the nose, and, and, and we'd be gone. But we could fly this thing. It, you know, the closer you can get something to being unstable, it means it just, it'll do all kinds of stuff. So in an airplane that you want highly maneuverable, a fighter, for example, you, want it, you don't want a big, stable airplane as a fighter because they're really hard to maneuver and everything. You want something like this that's right on the ragged edge of just going out of control, highly augmented with computers, just like the space shuttle. Space shuttle looks like a big, when we were flying the space shuttle, it's a behemoth, it's a 200,000 pound glider. Um, but it flies relatively well, it maneuvered relatively well and that's because it was a fly-by-wire system. Uh, computers, you move the stick, the computer said, ah, he or she wants me to do this. Well, he said do it fast, that'll kill him. So I'm gonna do it slow. Uh, he said do it slow. If I don't do it fast, that'll kill him. So it does it real fast. So that's what fly-by-wire systems do. They take the environment, they, they take the input that the pilot gives, and then they evaluate it and say, okay, I'm gonna do it, but I'm gonna do it at this rate, or I'm gonna do it at that rate, or I'm not gonna do it at all, because that'll really kill him. So this airplane, pilot puts in inputs, and it says, okay, go this way. And that's, uh, but you gotta work really hard to fly something like this. Final piece of advice, and then that's it from me. Uh, don't be afraid of failure. How many of you have dreamed of doing something in school where you are right now and you chickened out because you were too small, your friends were gonna tease you, your mom and dad said you couldn't do it, uh, you wanted to take a course, really hard course, but you didn't want to, you all get A's and B's or how, what kind of grading system? Huh? A's and B's? A's are good? F's are bad? Do you get F's? E's, E's are excellent. <laughs> Is that right? Are you the teacher? What do you teach? You tell them E's are excellent? No. E's are need improvement? Okay. Well, how many of you did not take a very difficult course because you had a straight A average and you didn't want to destroy your straight A average? No one? One right here. You're the, you're the one honest person. In, yeah. Another one up there? Okay. That's what I mean by not being afraid of failure. You know what, you and your teachers and your parents and consult say, you really need to do this. If you want to be a surgeon, you have to have some biology. You have to have this. You have to have that. If you want to be an engineer, you need to have this. If you want to be an astronaut, regretfully, you've got to have a technical background. You know, you could be a, Phi Beta Kappa is a big, big, honor society in the United States probably have the same thing here. Um, you know, you could be a Phi Beta Kappa in history and you're academically ineligible to be an astronaut. I, I don't agree with it, but that's the rule. And the rule is that way because we're looking for people who have a technical background. So there are things you need to do what you want to do. Don't be afraid of them, okay? And, and don't let anybody tell you that if you take that course and you get a B, your life is over. That's not true. Uh, even in some of, the, some of the best schools in the United States are starting to find that we put too much emphasis on quantitative measures 
of students in terms of potential. I mean, we have students who don't do very well academically in terms of quantitative measurements, but write incredible essays because it's thinking, it is critical thinking. When we pick people to be astronauts, we're looking for people who can perform critical thinking. So we love people who have been done research, uh, people who have been in the military as test pilots or test engineers or stuff like that. That's all I mean when I say don't be afraid of failure. We had just three tragic losses in the life of NASA. Apollo 1. A lot, of, a lot of my friends who are Apollo astronauts believe that we would have not gotten to the moon had it not been for the loss of the Apollo 1 crew. Uh, we, were, we were moving along. We thought we knew everything. And all of a sudden, on a launch pad, doing an exercise just before we were supposed to fly, we lost a crew. Tragic fire on the launch pad, but it turned the program around. We lost Challenger. I was telling the, the ambassador's wife earlier today, uh, my first flight occurred January of 1986. Uh, we launched on January 12th, landed on January 18th. I was about as high as you could be. My first trip to space. I mean, it was incredible. And we were finishing up our, our, our debriefs and everything 10 days later, and on the morning of January 28th, we sat in a conference room, not much unlike this, watching a TV, and watched Challenger lift off, and 73 seconds into flight, it was gone. With seven friends, just like, gone. And I thought about a nanosecond as to whether or not I was in the right business. You know, is this really what I want to do? That could have been me. Ten days ago, that could have been my crew and me. And, uh, and it took me about a nano, that's really short, okay? It took me about a nanosecond to say, hey, th this is why I came here. E everything you do in life, if it's worth doing it, if it's worth having it, it's worth a risk. So you cannot be risk averse. You have to be willing to take risk. It makes parents uncomfortable. Okay, I, I, as a parent and a grandparent, it makes us incredibly uncomfortable. But it also makes us incredibly proud when you decide you're going to take that risk and you study really hard and you work really hard so that you know what you're doing and then you go take the risk. Well, we don't, it's, not, it's not risk per se that, that we're worried about. It's, it's just non-thinking risk. We want you to take measured risks. So don't be afraid of failure in the things that you do. Next one. This is, I, I love this. This is one of my favorite images from space. Uh, anybody recognize this area? Where is this? Middle East. Uh, the Nile River flowing north in Egypt, uh, the Nile River Valley there, the Delta, the Sinai Peninsula right there, uh, the Red Sea, the Gulf of Aqaba, western Saudi Arabia, and the blackness up there, that's space in the daytime. When you go to space, today anyway, in the International Space Station, uh, back in the shuttle era, 90 minutes orbit of Earth. One, one, 90 minute, one orbit of Earth was 90 minutes, an hour and a half. 45 minutes of daylight, 45 minutes of darkness. When you're in the dark, phew, gazillions of stars and planets and stuff, just unbelievable. Pinpoints of light because you're outside our atmosphere, so you're not getting the scintillation of you know, light coming down through the atmosphere. When you're on the light side, it's like this. You, can't even, you don't see a star. I mean, space is just black. If you look at this thin blue line across the horizon there, that's our atmosphere. Not a lot of it. If you close your eyes and take your thumb, you know, close one eye, and take your thumb and do like that, you can obliterate the atmosphere. That's it. It's gone. Uh, that's what keeps us alive. So that's really important. I, I asked somebody, I, I was asking, you know, are you, what are you interested in? Somebody said climate change. That's good. That's really good that you're interested in that because that's what I'm worried about. You know, what are we doing to our atmosphere? What are we doing to our oceans? What are we doing to the things that sustain human life? Earth is very, very strong. It is not fragile. We always talk about this fragile Earth. We, humans, are the fragile pieces. Uh, so we've got to take care of Earth if we want to survive. OK? Next one. This is the Hubble Space Telescope. Absolutely incredible vehicle. Uh, we deployed it in 1990, uh, and it's still chugging along. It has six fully functioning telescopes on board. It's an observatory. It's not a People use the term telescope in referring to it, but it's actually an observatory with six individual instruments on it that does incredible things. Next one. Uh, that's Saturn. That's an image from Hubble. Don't pay any attention to the colors. Artificially generated because atmospheric scientists were interested in knowing, OK, what's in the atmosphere of, of uh, Saturn? So the computer generated the colors depending on the, the element. Next one. Uh, that's life aboard a shuttle just hanging around. Uh, they do the same thing today on the International Space Station. Uh, this was my crew from my, second, my, my third flight 
uh, aboard the shuttle Atlantis. Uh, Dirk from out, a Be Ameri uh, this is Belgium's first, he's the Alan Shepard of Belgium, Belgium's first astronaut. My co-pilot, Brian Duffy, and you see that we're all different directions in space going 17,500 miles an hour. Uh, gravity's overcome, um, so y you float, and, and that's what it's like. Uh, Dr. Kathy Sullivan, America's first woman to do a spacewalk. She's actually upside down, um, and I'm kind of back up against the ceiling and all that kind of stuff. And you can see Brian's spoon floating right there. This is his food, strawberries, probably potatoes, all that other kind of stuff. We eat normal foods, drink. Drinks don't behave. Liquids like to go all over the place. Food behaves. Uh, Newton's law, what's it say? A body at rest stays at rest. A body in motion stays in motion. I can open my food container, take it, and go like that very gently. It stays there. Go upside down very gently. It stays there. If I shake it, whatever's in it goes all over the place. But you know. Next one. This is, uh, what do we do in space? People always ask. We do a lot of experiments. Last year on the International Space Station, the crews did in excess of 400 different uh, experiments over the, over the course of a year. So you're always doing something. This is Dr. Franklin Chang, DS and me. We were doing actually uh, an experiment uh, that had to do with blood, with blood collection and storage. Uh, this is a long time ago, my last space shuttle mission. But we both trained for a year to be phlebotomists, you know, people that stick you and draw blood and all that kind of stuff. We had to be certified. So one day I would be the subject and he would be the phlebotomist. The next day he would be the subject and I would be the phlebotomist and we just alternated through our flight. And all these little tubes have all my blood and stuff like that in it. And we put it in a freezer. We'll spin it down and then put it in a freezer and bring it back. Next one. That's me brushing my teeth. You have to do normal things. Next slide. That's the bathroom. You have to do normal things. And so I, I, I'm not tall enough to do it, but you kind of come up here and you sit on the commode. And, and there's a handle right here and one right over here. You lift them up. They're spring-loaded. They rest on your thigh, and you can read a newspaper or read the magazine or whatever it is. Urine, uh, you take this little thing. It comes loose. It's held down by Velcro. Every crew member has their own little urine collection funnel, screws on the end, you move it wherever you need to move it. There's a fan in the system that creates gravity, creates kind of suction on artificial gravity since it's not there. So the solid waste goes into the commode as you would think. It's a giant bag, giant trash bag, just stays there until you come back and then they throw it away. The urine goes into one of two wastewater tanks under the floor and it stays there until you come back and they throw it away. Next slide. That's me. Uh, and that's getting ready to come home. This is a, called a launch and entry suit. After we lost Challenger in 1986, some people believe that if the crew had had some supplemental form of pressurization and oxygen, they would not have perished. Uh, I'm not one that believes that, but anyway, we went to wearing a launch and entry suit. It's a partial pressure suit, parachute on your back and stuff that you could bail out once you got back into the atmosphere, emergency oxygen bottles, and then the only thing missing is a helmet that you wear and and you have your own little cocoon in which you live if something happened inside the shuttle. Next slide. This is what it looks like during reentry, the early part. Remember, well, I didn't tell you. It takes you eight and a half minutes to get to space. You go <laughs> lift off, and you're just shaking all over the place. It's a relatively gentle lift off. It's about a G and a half, so not violent the way people think, except for all the vibration. I mean, things. <laughs> and then eight and a half minutes, you're in space, going 17,500 miles an hour, meters. Per second, per hour, 30,000 meters per, I forget, you all speak meters, right? You knew what I was talking about though, right? Fast, okay? <laughs> you go fast. You light two engines on the back, it slows you down about 300 miles an hour. Gravity does the rest. Gravity starts to gradually pull this giant glider back to Earth. It takes an hour to come home. First half hour, you're just coming back through space, trying to get to the atmosphere. And then all of a sudden, poof, you puncture the atmosphere, half an hour of atmospheric reentry. Vehicle really heats up, and what you're seeing is the glow from the tile on the outside of the vehicle reaching pretty hot, I mean, thousands of degrees out there, centigrade or Fahrenheit, no matter what you say. Next one, and I think it's the, this is where we're going. SpaceX is, is one uh, private provider. We're planning to fly a demonstration flight taking cargo to the International Space Station end of this month, next month with SpaceX. Orbital Sciences is another company that's going to fly this summer. And then we will have a private capability of carrying cargo to the International Space Station. We have a number of private companies that are trying to develop a system that will take humans to space in place of the shuttle. So that's, that's where some of you are going to travel to space. Next one. That's, uh, this is the space launch system, heavy lift launch vehicle. 
that NASA's building to do exploration, to take us to Mars, to asteroid, asteroids, uh, other places. Next one. Uh, this is the shuttle landing and final one. That's the International Space Station up there. Uh, that's kind of what it looks like and all that. And I'll let you read this saying. The reason I put it up there was because it talks about uh, hope and help and how you do stuff. You know, you, God gives you a, a limited amount of time here on this earth. And essentially what it says is you do everything you can in the time that you have in the place that you are. So, so that's kind of a message. Questions? Uh, yeah. Who? I think we're going to, uh, we've got a question from Adward Townsend, who's uh, in Christchurch Grammar in Western Australia. Oh. Uh, Adward, are you ready? Okay, come on up, Edward. We got you. Don't be bashful. Why President Kennedy challenged man to step on the moon? What do you believe is achievable in the next 50 years? Oh, and what's what achievable? I'm sorry? And what, what will be the contribution to NASA to humanity in this next period? For those of you who didn't understand the question, I think what he said was, what's achievable in the next 50 years? You know, President Kennedy challenged us to go to the moon in this decade and bring humans safely home. President Obama has challenged us to put humans on an asteroid by 2025, Mars by the mid 2030s. Uh, we're going to accomplish those things. I think what you'll find in the next 50 years, we won't use the term commercial space anymore because it will, be, it will just be a normal thing. Uh, that's the way that all of you, if you decide you wanna go to space, You'll, you can either go as a part of a, a, an organized government program, NASA, the Australian Space Agency, if there is one 50 years from now. Uh, you may even find, I, I, I say it only half jokingly, there, 50 years from now, NASA may not exist. There may be no national space programs. We may be in a federation of space programs, like similar to the United Nations, where nations come together to explore because we have already achieved Mars, Martian landings and the like, and we're off to see if humans can go into deep, 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 deep space, maybe to places beyond. In terms of science, uh, hopefully we will, we, have, we will never solve the climate change problem, but hopefully by, by then we will really understand it a lot better than we do today. We will have stopped doing things that humans do that, 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 that disaffect the atmosphere, disaffect our environment. Uh, we'll be doing things a lot smarter. We'll be living in green societies and the like. Airplanes will be going supersonic, hypersonic speeds. Uh, you'll travel around the world you know, in, in an hour or so uh, instead of taking a couple of days the way you do today. Um, those are some of the things that I think you'll see. OK, um, we'll go now to Chuit College. Uh, how about we go to Luan Wa? What is your typical data and hold? in our special typical daily routine. Oh, a typical daily routine? Um, you wake up, you do uh, a number of experiments that are lined up for that day. You'll do them. Among those experiments, almost every day is Earth observations, where you just get in a window. On the station, we have a cupola now that's like a big picture window. You can actually get down in it because it's, it's a, a glass structure that sticks out from the International Space Station that gives you a panoramic view. So a, a large portion of your day is Earth observations, photography, and imaging. If you go on the NASA website, you'll see the aurora, uh, nighttime lights of Earth. Those are kinds of things that we do. So experiments all day long. Somebody on the crew is almost always doing maintenance on, sta on the station. So those are, those are typical days. All right. Um, we had a uh, question from Marucci. Alex, I think you had one about preparing. Oh, where's Alex? Over there. Hi, Alex. <laughs> Um, what did you find was your most interesting or odd experience in practicing or preparing to go into outer space? The most humorous or odd? Or interesting, any? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> this is going to sound really gross. Uh, the most interesting was learning how to go to the bathroom in space. You actually train for that. Uh, you know, because you got this, you can understand. <laughs> That was, the, that was the oddest. Um, I think the most interesting was just getting accustomed to my crew members, particularly um, because in my four flights, uh, all but my first flight were international missions, whether it was uh, a, a payload of international experiments uh, or twice I was blessed to have flown on my uh, third flight with Dirk Fromout as a mission specialist, a payload specialist. 
And then my fourth flight, just absolutely incredible with Sergei Krikalov. Uh, he is the longest, longest living in space human being today. Um, when we flew my flight in 19, our flight together in 1994, he had lived in space for 15 months. He had been there during the time of the Soviet Union, five months on Mir, and then he had gone back for another four-month mission, which ended up being 10 months because the wall fell, the Soviet Union disintegrated, and it took a while for Russia, his, his new country, to get him home. Uh, he and his crew and his backup, uh, Vladimir Titov, they brought their families to Houston, and they, we lived and worked together for two years. Uh, getting to understand them and their culture, having them understand us and our culture, finding out that in, in principle we were all the same. You know, we all wanted to make the world better for our kids. Uh, watched his daughter, Olga, grow up from four years old then to be this incredibly gorgeous, tall Russian woman today who's, you know, following in her mother and father's footsteps. So that, that was the thing that I cherished the most, was the people. It kind of leads into um, a question that was sent in from Aidan Coombe from Christchurch Grammar School, oh, sorry, Circular Head Christian School in Tasmania. And he was asking about what the physio physical and physiological effects are when you come back to Earth. Big, you know, when you come back to Earth, biggest effects are when you go to space. Uh, remember I said eight and a half minutes to get to orbit, boom, you're in zero G. I mean, gravity is overcome. It's still there. You're still in a gravity environment, but you're going... 30,000 30, kilometers an hour, um, gravity is overcome. Instantly, fluids that are pooled in your lower extremities sitting down here. I mean, reach down and feel your calf. Uh, most of you have nice, firm calves the way I do. Uh, you, <laughs> that is kind of vain, isn't it? Minor. That's right, I'm a grandpa. Uh, you, when you reach down and do that in space, I mean, instantaneously, that's gone. I mean, it's your legs nice and flat down there, and all of a sudden you have this tremendous feeling in your head like the world's worst head cold. The fluids have redistributed themselves. They've, they've seek, they have sought equilibrium, and so the same amount of fluid that's, that's in your head is in your calves, same amount everywhere. So that's the first big thing. Your bones begin to lose calcium and minerals, so you have loss of bone mass, your, your, body, your, bone, your muscles begin to atrophy like you're wearing a cast. So we have to do countermeasures. We lift weights, we do bicycle ergometer, you do a lot of things. When you come back to Earth, you've got to replace these two liters of fluid that you peed away uh, your first couple of days of orbit to get rid of this fullness in your head. So you're just gulping down water doing the reentry. And then you have to get accustomed to being back in a gravity environment. You can do the muscular part pretty quick, takes a couple of weeks to months to readapt spatially uh, so that your inner ear begins to function again. Because with no gravity, your balance mechanism doesn't work in space. So there's no up or down or any of that kind yeah, of stuff. Yeah, so that's what I was thinking about is if it's zero gravity, you know, you're orbiting, you're spinning, yep. how do you know you're upside down? You don't, and you don't care. And, and in fact, if you remember <laughs> the, the photo I showed you of my crew uh, on STS-45, we didn't care whether we were upside down or right side up. You learn how to, your food is there in your food container and with reference to you, it's normal. So you take your fork or your spoon and you eat your food very gently, you drink your liquids, you go to the bathroom, you don't care whether you're upside down or not because the fan turns on and it draws the fecal matter away from the body, it draws the urine away and sends it down through the tube. You really don't care. You look out the window, one of the reasons we get spatial disorientation, some, some astronauts do, is because you float to the window and you look and Earth that you expect to be down there is up there. And it just kind of blows your mind, so to speak. And, but you, you understand, OK, there is no up or down. Uh, when you come back to Earth, you have yeah. to reorient. And that takes days, sometimes months, for people after what, long What did duration. you think when you first looked down and you saw it? I cried. I, I mean, literally. I, my first flight, I, I, just, I was completely overwhelmed emotionally. I was really, really, really ready technically uh, to perform because mm -hmm. We had trained, I'd, I'd trained landing the vehicle, I'd trained doing my experiments. There is no way to train someone for looking out at Earth from that vantage point. You don't see the little blue marble because you're not far enough away. You see half of Earth at a time, but you look down, it is the most beautiful specter that, that one could see. Um, and it just depends on where you are as to what you see. Incredible. Okay. Um, we're going to go now to Victoria. I think we've still got VSEC online. And we've got a question from Ryan. Andrew, he's from Year 8 down in Victoria. Hi, Ryan. 
Hi. What's your question, Ryan? Do the scientists or engineers from NASA plan to eradicate the space junk that orbits Earth and space in the future? They tell me to give you a punchy answer, Ryan. Yes. We're, we're trying, but that's hard. Uh, Ryan's question relates to remove, removing space junk. And uh, removing space junk is very difficult. The Swiss, some of you may have read, are looking at an experiment where they're going to fly uh, what they call micro uh, satellites or, or very small sats uh, that have a capability of flying up next to debris and attracting it sort of like a magnet, a super magnet, and then dragging it back down through the atmosphere where it burns up. We are looking hard at, at ways to get rid of space debris because it's, it's getting to be much more of a problem than it used to be as more and more nations fly into space and you create much more junk. Okay. Um, we've got time to take another question from the audience. Uh, oh, up the back. Uh, I was wondering um, how uh, I heard how do black holes come to be? And oh, how do black holes come to be? Yeah. I don't know. <laughs> now, I, I mean, that's, I, I'm going to, we, as best we know, uh, as, as black holes are described, and the astrophysicist over here can probably help us, they're, they're huge voids of energy and other things that it, theoretically they just, they suck up everything. Uh, we now know that black holes exist. We have, we have evidence that they exist. Uh, how they came to be, I don't, I don't actually know, and that's a good research project, uh, not, not pushing the teachers, but to try to, you know, try to understand. We spend a lot of time in astrophysics today trying to understand how our stars formed, uh, how our planets formed. People say, why do we need to send humans into deep space? Why do we need to study an asteroid? It's because asteroids will give us hints about our own Earth. Uh, more, one of the main reasons we do astrophysics and planetary science and everything is because we know that Earth is a relatively young planet and we can learn from asteroids and other moons and other things how we got here. So that's one of the reasons we do the stuff we do. But I, I don't know the answer to your question, to be quite honest. Okay, okay and then uh, we've got Caitlin from Marucci had a question. Where's Caitlin? Just down in the middle here, uh, Michael. What was your best experience in space? My best experience in space? It's sort of what I talked about before, the human experience. Um, just having an opportunity, to, uh, having an opportunity to, to live and work with people from different cultures, different countries, uh, and finding out that there's not that much difference among us. Um, we think about the same, same things. We have the same aspirations. Everybody wants the world to be better and more peaceful. Uh, so that, that was the, my most precious memory from my time in space. Yes. Yeah. And over here, no questions over here? When and how did NASA start? NASA was actually founded in 1958 uh, as a result of the National Space Act. There used to be an organization called NACA, N-A-C-A, the National... I forget what NACA stood for, <laughs> but it... It, see, I've got historians up here. They're going to Google it now and going to tell me. <laughs> but NACA was involved in only aeronautics. Uh, in 1958, President Eisenhower started thinking about, you know, do we really want to think about humans going into space? And we needed an organization that would be able to not only think about aeronautics, but think about aerospace. And so the National Aeronautics and Space Administration uh, was named as a part of the National uh, Space Act of 1958. We've had numerous changes to it over time. Uh, each president generally will put out his or her own national space policy that amplifies it and the like. So that's how, that's how we came about and that's how we exist today. Well, I think we're, we're going to have to wrap no. it up. I know. Oh. But um, thank you so much thank for coming you. in thank and so speaking yeah. to us all. How about a hand? <laughs> Can I say one more thing? Yeah, one thing. Yeah. One, 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 more, one more quick thing, and I, I usually spend a lot more time dwelling on Nikosi Johnson, the saying I put up on the, on the thing there. Some of you read it and some of you didn't. I usually spend a lot of time there because the, the key, Nikosi Johnson was a, was, died at the age of 12 in South Africa from AIDS. 
which is immaterial. The fact was he was always upbeat and positive and wanting to make his village and then his country and then the world better. Uh, the point I'd like to make is you all are the future. You are the future. You ask me what we're going to be doing in 50 years. I should be asking you that. Uh, we will do what you determine the world should do in 50 years. And it's really important that you study and work and not be afraid of failure, like I told you. So don't, don't let anybody tell you you cannot do something. Uh, dream, dream big, and then go make it happen. So thank you all very much. Thank you. Thank you very much.